Welcome everyone to today's edition of Tibet Talks Europe. My name is Kai Müller. I'm executive director of the International Campaign for Tibet in Germany, and I will guide you through today's discussion. Today we are going to speak about Germany's EU presidency in the context of the EU's relations with China, and we want to specifically look at human rights, democracy, and rule of law related issues with a special focus on Tibet. Almost every week, unfortunately, human rights related issues in China make the news. Yesterday, a landmark report on so-called birth control measures in Xinjiang. Today, the passing of the so-called security law in Hong Kong. And in Tibet, we have seen the sentencing of a prominent human rights defender recently to a lengthy prison term, the passing of a number of repressive regulations over the past month, and consequently, the Communist Party demanding what they say is absolute loyalty from Tibetans. It is a challenging time, and we want to look at what we would like to see Germany doing at the helm of the EU presidency. Germany is one of the most important countries in a European context and has deep relations trade-wise politically with China. What should the German government and what should the EU institutions undertake to meaningfully address the many issues I just mentioned very briefly? I am happy to have with us today, albeit electronically, Ms. Gudi Jensen and Mr. Raphael Glucksmann, who are both members of parliament based in Berlin and Brussels uh, slash Strasbourg. Gudi Jensen is a German politician of the Free Democratic Party who has been serving as a member of the German Bundestag since 2017. Since 2018, she has been chairing the Bundestag's Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid and she has overseen a number of the committee's initiatives on the human rights situation in China. With regard to Tibet, she has recently, uh, recently co-signed a statement on the Panchen Lama, and in 2019, her group joined a committee declaration on Tibet. As many, Ms. Jensen is very vocal on social media, and quite, quite uh, recently so, in particular, on Hong Kong. Thank you, Ms. Jensen, for being with us today. Mr. Raphael Glucksmann is a well-known French journalist and a politician. Between 2005 and 2012, he was an advisor to former president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili. He founded the political party Glas Publique in 2018. In May 2019, he was elected as member of the European Parliament within the SND Alliance. He is the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Human Rights and also a member of the Committee of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Glucksmann is one of the most outspoken MEPs on human rights issues in China. Thank you, Raphael Glucksmann, for being with us. And I'm happy to have with us our EU policy director, Vincent Metten, uh, who is based in Brussels and who has been advocating for Tibetan rights at the European level for a number of years. ICT has submitted a five-point action plan uh, to the German EU presidency on Tibet. And I would like to give Vincent the first word to highlight these action points. We then move on to hear from Ms. Jensen and then from Mr. Glucksmann. You, as an audience, have the chance to submit questions to the group, and please use Facebook for this. We will then collect these questions. Vincent Metten, please, you have the first word. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, the human rights situation in Tibet remains indeed deeply concerning as China has increased its repressive policies there. Tibet has been turned into a police state with control and surveillance measures now replicated in Xinjiang, the region where China has reportedly detained more than one million Uyghurs and other Muslim in mass internment camps. As Beijing has blocked access to Tibet, the situation on the ground has become a muted crisis. At stake is the survival of Tibetan culture, language and religion. In the last few months, and in particular since the COVID-19 crisis started, the EU has shown a more confident attitude in pushing back against Chinese disinformation and divide and rule attitude in Europe. The EU shamed China for its role in propagating coronavirus related fake news. After the last EU-China summit on 22nd of June, Joseph Borrell said, China is a partner on climate change, but also a competitor and at the same time a rival. He has called for a more robust EU strategy for China, but we have yet to see what it means in practice. European countries are split both internally and externally. Some have no policies on China, others have a position, but a schizophrenic one 
with foreign ministry pulling in one direction and uh, defensive intelligence agencies pulling in another one. Some EU member states have adopted public strategy on China, like uh, Sweden or the Netherlands, and some others have non-public strategy in order to coordinate domestic policies on China. The Leipzig leaders' meeting with Xi Jinping supposed to take place in September has been postponed. The official explanation is the coronavirus, but there might be other reasons, such as the development in Hong Kong, where the new national security law adopted by China will come into effect tomorrow, and the difficulty for the EU to adopt a shared view on China. But as EU leaders seem now to be more assertive on China, they also need to be coherent in their approach and challenge China more forcefully on its human rights records at home. The EU-China dialogue on human rights has shown its limits. Over the years, it has progressively been downgraded by the Chinese side. The dialogue is more a sort of closed box discussion, which fails to have any sort of concrete impact on the ground, despite the efforts deployed by the European External Action Service. It has to be completely reassessed. So what is now needed is a much more assertive, united and ambitious EU policy with regard to human rights in China and Tibet. The EU must invest political capital and take the lead in pushing back against the alternative model of governance proposed by China and resist to Chinese influence as underlined by Chancellor Merkel to Le Monde last Monday. So ICT has addressed indeed to the German Minister of Foreign Affairs a briefing note entitled Addressing the Muted Crisis in Tibet, Five Action Plan for the EU German Presidency. The document is available on our website. Let me briefly present these points. Firstly, we call German EU presidency to urge China to stop the persecution, surveillance, torture, and ill treatment, and forced disappearances and arbitrary detention of Tibetans who simply exercise their human rights. On 6 December last year, Anya Sengdra, a 47-year-old Tibetan nomad and community leader, was sentenced to seven years in prison for, I quote, provoking agitation and gathering people to disrupt public order. Anya was an anti-corruption campaigner who has criticized local officials for misusing public money, notably from relocated nomads, and ran campaigns against illegal mining activities and the hunting of endangered animals. He had appealed against his sentence, but his lawyer announced on the 17th of June via a tweet that his appeal has been rejected. On 6 July, the Dalai Lama will turn 85 years old. Chinese communist regime has made it very clear that it wants to control the next reincarnation. So far, a few countries, the US, Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, have taken a public stand saying that it's up to the Tibetan Buddhist community and the Dalai Lama himself to select and appoint the next Dalai Lama. We are asking the German EU presidency to adopt a similar statement on behalf of the 27 EU member states. And the EU could go one step further, as the US Tibetan Policy, Policy and Support Act does, is to recognize any Chinese officials involved in, in interfering in this process as a serious human rights violator. This decision could go with a number of sanctions, including denying to those officials access to European territory or freezing and confiscating their financial assets. The third recommendation is on an environmental issue. Tibet is known as the third pole. It's also a home of a rich and unique flora and fauna, including endangered species such as the Tibetan antelope and the snow leopard, and is probably one of the most environmentally strategic and sensitive region in the world. However, in recent years, Chinese policy of track, uh, fast track development based on an urban industrial model in Tibet have been damaging this fragile high altitude ecosystem. We call the EU to raise environmental issues on the Tibetan plateau and Tibetans' social, economic and cultural rights in line of the European Green Deal and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The EU must promote the opening up of the Tibetan plateau for scientific research and international collaboration. It must also discuss environmental issues with China in all relevant platforms of cooperation, such as the Environment Policy Dialogue, the Climate Change Partnership, and the EU-China Water Policy Dialogue. When it comes to Tibet, Europe's relationship with China is defined by a lack of reciprocity. Most European governments allow Chinese citizens to travel freely to our countries, 
while China routinely forbids Europeans from visiting Tibet, in particular journalists, diplomats, UN delegates, and members of parliament. In 2018, the US passed the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, which says that Chinese officials directly responsible for keeping Americans out of Tibet will be denied entry to the United States. The government in Europe, as well as the EU, should pass their own version of this act. This is a message that 57 parliamentarians from 19 countries, including MEP Glucksmann, raised in an op-ed published recently. Last point, between 2002 and 2010, envoys of the 14 Dalai Lama held nine rounds of discussion with representatives of the Chinese government. On your screen, you can see now a picture of one of these meetings that happened in, in Beijing in the past. We urge now for the resumption of this Sino-Tibetan dialogue and we ask Germany to play a facilitating role in this process, which remains, in our view, an effective way to achieve a mutual and durable solution for the crisis in Tibet. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that in front of China, you have two important tools that you can use. Firstly, the policy and strategy developed must contain concrete and pragmatic measures and should not only be based on declamatory attitude. The EU, EU must show determination by transforming rhetorics into operational conclusion, blocking access to Europe to Chinese officials who are blocking European citizens to travel to Tibet, or sanctioning officials involved in a succession of the next Dalai Lama are, for example, concrete tools that the, the, the EU should now seriously, seriously consider. The second leverage is to build coalition of like-minded people or governments, in particular with Asian countries. Beijing dislikes when such group of people or countries start exchanging information, coordinating, coordinating strategies, adopting common statements. Let me give you three encouraging examples. Last week, the US Secretary of State said that his country has accepted, accepted the European Union's offer made by Mr. Borrell to create a new dialogue to discuss the threat China poses to the West. Secondly, on 26 of June, more than 50 UN independent experts on China signed a joint statement calling the international community to act collectively and decisively to ensure China respects human rights and its, its international obligation. And on the next slide, you can see the numbers of signatories of this important statement. They also urge, urge the Human Rights Council to conduct a special, special session on China and to create an independent mechanism on human rights violation in China. The last example is the setting up of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. It is presented as an, I quote, international cross-party group of legislators working towards reform on how democratic countries approach China. So far, there are 32 co-chairs and more around 100 members, including Mr. Raphael Glucksmann. It has recently launched a campaign about the treatment of Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. So we hope this group will continue to grow and that it will also play an active role on promoting the respect for human rights in China and also in Tibet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vincent Matten, for this import. And um, I would like to now give the word to Ms. Jensen, who's also, by the way, member of IPAC, um, which you've just mentioned. And um, yeah, speaking of, of current developments, uh, namely Hong Kong, for example, today, um, Ms. Jensen, you've been very active on Twitter, uh, not only on Twitter, of course, but um, particularly there as well on the issue of Hong Kong. And just quite recently, you, uh, you tweeted um, with regard to a G7 statement on Hong Kong um, that Germany and our foreign minister uh, need to gather more self-confidence uh, before it's up to Germany uh, to hold the EU presidency. Um, my question is, what, can you elaborate? What, what would you expect? What, what would a self-confident uh, EU look like under Germany's presidency? And somewhat connected to this, let me also um, ask the question with regard to the so-called minorities uh, in the People's Republic. Um, how, can, how can the EU develop leverage in the context of such a more self-confident uh, approach towards the situations of Tibetans and Uyghurs? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Müller. Um, I think I can uh, directly uh, go on from uh, the end of the statement of Mr. Metten um, and also answer your two questions. Um, let me make five to seven points what we should do within uh, the upcoming um, months of our EU presidency, but also how we can develop a more self-confident way of uh, dealing with China. Josep Borrell asked for a more robust strategy when it comes to dealing with China. And I, what I always hear is we are, as uh, Germany, but also as Europe, we are dependent on the People's Republic. We need to have uh, an economic exchange with China because we are dependent. I think it is not a one-way street. It is not only us being dependent on China in a global system of not only economic uh, interrelations, but also uh, values that we share on the U uh, UN level. We are interdependent. So China always also is reliable or relies on um, German country, uh, on, on German uh, companies coming to China, coming to Hong Kong. Um, so it is not a one way street. Um, and I think it is a wrong narrative that Chancellor Merkel, but also uh, certain EU member states draw when they say it is only um, us being dependent on China. That's the first thing we need, not only within the EU uh, presidency, but also further, we need to uh, monitor human rights uh, violations in China, in Tibet, in regions such as Xinjiang. And it is not a new, um, these information that uh, come through media at the moment, these information are not new for human rights agencies for you. Um, you've been dealing with these, um, with these uh, positions and uh, informations a very long time. And I think we have a special momentum at the moment because on the one hand, we have the US who is very outspoken when it comes to um, addressing uh, sanctions and uh, calling out the wrongdoing of China. And on the other hand, we have a very silent EU uh, that currently is trying to find its voice. And I think this momentum we should use and we should lead from Germany, from France, from countries um, such as Scandinavian countries or also the Netherlands together with these initiatives that we see like IPAC where Australia, Canada um, are also um, very engaged in to show that it is not only Germany who is concerned about a national security law that just was passed or that it's not just Germany who is, um, who is, um, who is condemning these reactions from China but it is um, an international effort that China needs to respond to. There is um, an obligation for the international community to uh, condemn not only in the security law, but also human rights violations that have been taking place for so long. And I think now is the momentum where we can do that more than ever. So um, with these calling of um, human rights violations, we also need to point out that it's that there is a need and the obligation for China to grant access, not only to Tibet, but also to regions such as Xinjiang. And um, Germany need to react, needs to react a little faster when it comes to China calling the shots at the moment. And we are always one to five steps behind. I think that needs to change, not only in these upcoming months, but in general. The third point I'd like to make um, and we heard about a sanction regime that is currently discussed in the EU. The Parliament um, just recently um, issued a resolution um, with a big majority um, that I think is currently, maybe um, Mr. Glucksmann can shed some, some light on that, is currently sitting in the Commission or in the Council. And I think we need to put pressure within our German EU presidency on the establishment of such a um, sanction regime that directly links between uh, human rights violations of KP or CCP officials and, um, for example, travel bans or asset freezes, because I think that exactly these kinds of measures would directly 
impact on people who are actually responsible for human rights violations and not are directed against a whole country that is dependent or um, that cannot change the regime or the system. So we would encourage Chancellor Merkel um, in the upcoming weeks to, uh, to urge for such a mechanism, um, be it uh, or name it uh, Magnitsky law or something else. I think it's more important to have the mechanism than to talk about how we name uh, the regime. Um, then the EU-China summit, um, it was already mentioned in our opinion, and we stated that uh, three weeks ago in the plenary uh, here in the Bundestag, um, this summit should have been cancelled altogether, not for coronavirus reasons, but for the reason that um, we have we do not have a level playing field when it comes to good dialogue. I think it would be more a propaganda uh, festival, and I think we should not encourage uh, encourage Germany to lead this way into such a propaganda. Um, festival. Let's keep these words. Um, so it is not about cancelling dialogue altogether. It is more about um, searching for the right channel to keep on dialogue. And the last thing I'd like to uh, point out, um, and I said that in the very beginning, um, when we talk to people also here in, in the Bundestag, people tend to change their mind in recent um, due to recent events from the, the People's Republic. And I think it's important to get these people on our side and say it is not just about um, pick and choose um, whether you are uh, on a delegation travel to China when it comes to economic reasons or economic questions. It is always about um, linking human rights and economic freedom. Social and economic freedom always have to go together. It is not either or, it is linked together and only then a society and a, a prospering economic um, hub such as China can, can successfully thrive in the world, I think. And that's what we need to stress and that's what currently is going down the drain in Hong Kong. Uh, one country, two systems does not exist anymore. Um, it didn't exist before this national security law, in my opinion. But definitely, it will not uh, it will not survive uh, the uh, the day tomorrow where uh, the law comes into effect. And I think we, as the international community, need to support free to, freedom activists such as Joshua Wong or others more than ever before to show that the international community is paying attention and is not backing down by. Um, the uh, the pressure that China applies to every single one of uh, people who are expressing criticism. I think criticism is very important at the moment. And um, yeah, w with that, I think I'd like to close. Maybe I I've shown a little bit, um, I've, I've explained a little bit about the question, how we could be more self-confident and uh, maybe this momentum is something that especially Chancellor Merkel uh, could do because she has a very high standing in Asian countries. And um, maybe last thing, when we talk about an Asia a strategy, people tend to think it's only China, but Asia is so much more than just China and countries such as uh, Malaysia or Vietnam or Indonesia, the Philippines, they're all waiting for more interaction with Europe, with the US, with Germany in particular. And if we only pay attention to China, I think it is, um, we do not see the whole picture. And I think we need to see it, especially within this presidency that is coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jensen, for this, uh, this assessment. Um, I take from it that it's a very dynamic uh, situation and also, um, we're also in the European Parliament, and I would just like would just quick, quickly pick up on one of your your um, reference being made to the European Parliament to Mr. Glucksmann. Um, maybe you can answer it in the course of his presentation. Where are we in terms of the Magnitsky 
um, uh, development Magnitsky law, any sanctions regime on the European level. It would be quite interesting to hear from you. And also, I would, I've written down, of course, some questions which uh, we have prepared for you. And uh, particularly, I'm, I'm interested in, in your assessment of the EU is dealing with China. Um, I gather you've been very critical recently. You're saying uh, nice hashtags, but in reality, not, mu not much that's being done. For example, in terms of the Uyghurs, your assessment of Tibet would also be interesting to hear. And also, I gather you are very, very active in terms of due diligence of companies and corporations uh, in terms of their human rights obligations. Where, where, where do you see uh, European corporations in terms of their China uh, business, if I may say, that their connections to China, their activities in China in terms of their human rights um, obligations? So, if you could please give us some insight. Hello to uh, to everybody. Um, first, I must say I'm, I'm I'm quite happy to to be with you because I do think that uh, Tibet was uh, the tragic laboratory in terms of uh, the Chinese uh, crackdown system. And what we are witnessing now in uh, in Xinjiang and and, and against the Uyghurs, uh, it was already shaped uh, against Tibetan people. And um, that's why I think it's very important to maintain pressure on the Tibetan issue. And I want to thank you for the job you are doing. And I think it's 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 really important. I mean, of course, there are more than just hashtags when it comes to European policies towards uh, China. But what strikes me is that um, when it comes to facts and acts, there is nothing anymore. You can have from time to time statements, but uh, you don't have policy. And, that, and that's, that's, that's the biggest fault I see uh, in, in, in this. I think it's, we are both uh, at the European level, naive and indifferent. We are naive when it comes to our sovereignty and breaches to our sovereignty and uh, our relationship with China as a geopolitical power. And we are indifferent to human rights. So I think we need to be uh, quite concrete. Uh, we could put pressure on China if we were able to show to the Chinese authorities that we are serious. And how do you do to show them that you are serious when you speak about human rights? Because it's very nice to make statements about uh, the voice of Europe is a voice for universality and human rights. But then if it's not backed by facts and acts, uh, authoritarian regimes, they, don't, uh, they simply take it as a game. And I'm afraid that uh, when it comes to certain of our leaders, it is actually a game and Chinese authorities are right. So how we uh, show to them that we are serious about it? I think one, one very important step was already mentioned. It's, it's a European uh, human rights sanction regime. And I agree fully. I don't care if we call it a Magnitsky Act or, or, or European Human Rights Act or whatever act you want, but we need a targeted system and we need the European Union to be able to sanction high-level official involved in crackdown uh, um, in, in the crackdown whether it's in Tibet whether it's against Uyghurs or whether it's in Hong Kong or whether it's in China against dissidents and 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 right now the parliament has voted with a large majority but it's stuck uh, Mr. Borrell with the high representative say that he was supporting the the idea of a European Magnitsky Act and the council basically formulated the idea that it was not against but for the moment nothing happens and it's always like that in Europe so there is an issue here and uh, we have the, the need to um, have uh, NGOs and, and, and public opinions involved because what I'm afraid of is that it will no, never, never, never happen if there are not pressures put on, on, on our leaders and on the European Council. So that's the first thing. But if we have targeted sanction regime, then we start to be serious in the eyes of authoritarian regime and especially uh, the Chinese regime. Then the second very concrete 
ID, and I, I'm not saying that just because I'm rapporteur about this uh, European legislation, but I think that one very useful tool is the uh, EU human rights diligence, due diligence uh, legislation. The idea is that basically, if you, I don't know, I think everybody heard about the ASPI report uh, about these 83 international companies benefiting directly or indirectly uh, from the uh, forced labor of uh, Uyghurs that are in the camps, uh, in the Chinese camps. And these 83 companies, they basically uh, should be, uh, uh, we should be able to actually uh, prosecute them. I mean, it should be outlawed. And uh, right now, because they are just uh, furnishers employing uh, slaves, or because uh, they are uh, filials, and you can't do anything. So it's very important to put pressure on companies that are actually uh, cooperating, collaborating with the crackdown system. And uh, this legislation should pass at the end of this year, and then the commission needs to turn it into a, a directive early in 2021, which would be an efficient, um, an efficient tool because the, the actual situation right now is that uh, with the turn that has taken globalization, actually when you buy an iPhone or when, when you buy yourself your Adidas or your Nike, you are de facto part of the crackdown system of the Chinese regime. And uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a situation that we cannot allow to continue. And again, Chinese authorities will take us seriously if we start uh, to uh, have this kind of legislation and, 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 and put in jeopardy their uh, uh, cash uh, resource from international companies. The third aspect I, I want to mention is I think we all witnessed during the COVID crisis, but it was the case before, that uh, you have Chinese interference into our uh, democratic debate in Europe. And uh, through disinformation, through influence campaigns, and and China is not the only authoritarian regime to play this game. Of course, you have uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia, which is also very active in uh, supporting far right movements all over Europe uh, in, in disinformation campaigns. So what we, I mean, I was the one in in the European Parliament to push for it. We have set up now a special committee on foreign interference, and I think it's really important that we stop being naive when it comes to authoritarian regime campaigning in Europe and using uh, lobbies in Europe to be able uh, to influence our policies. So the, the, the two main aspects is let's start to be serious about human rights first. And second, let's start to be serious about our sovereignty. And it includes, I think we can't reshape uh, our policy towards China or actually shape a China policy if we go on being so dependent on China. And we have seen that during the crisis. I mean, in France, we were not even able to produce uh, masks or, 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 or basic paracetamol without uh, China. And it, it needs to stop because then when you speak to officials in Paris, they tell you, but do you see, you want us to take uh, very uh, tough stances against China but at the same time, we are totally dependent on China. So if you want to have a coherent China policy, you need to stop being constantly in a position of dependence and vassality. You need to shape, reshape a European sovereignty and, and, and the capacity of being autonomous in your decision making process. So all of that questions in general are our policies. And, um, and that's why I, I think that it's, it won't happen in one day because you have too many interests, entrenched interests and also habits. But we need uh, pressure coming from public opinion on that. Right now in France, for instance, we are trying to shape a campaign involving thousands and thousands of, of youngsters on, on, on the Uyghur situation. And, and, and actually, uh, we got some results because uh, companies like Adidas and Lacoste had to respond to the interpolation of the public and, and promise they will stop uh, their connection with uh, with uh, 
the crackdown, Chinese crackdown system and, and, and uh, concentration camps in, uh, in Xinjiang. So, but we need to, to put constant pressure because otherwise uh, it won't work. In European Parliament, we passed a good resolution on Hong Kong, a good resolution on, on, um, on, uh, on the Uyghur situation. We passed several resolutions on Tibet and we passed uh, a, a general resolution on Magnitsky Act. But then the decisions have to be made by uh, actual leaders. That's the problem of European Union right now is that the real power is uh, inside the Council. And that's where you have an issue because uh, actually there is not such a will to uh, put in jeopardy or in danger the, the very big business interests that many countries have with China. And that's why the German presidency will be so important because actually if, if one person in Europe has the moral and political authority to uh, actually shape uh, a China policy that's based on, on, on human rights and on the concerns about our sovereignty, it's Angela Merkel. And that's why this month will be really important. And I, I think we should all work together to make sure that uh, she understands there is a call coming from uh, not only Germany, but all across Europe for, for, for being serious on that, and, and both on human rights and on sovereignty issues. So I think that that's part of uh, our discussion, but it really should be our main concern for the next uh, six months. Thank you, Mr. Guxman. I think it, it, it's really crucial to look at these six months in terms of, of concrete uh, measures that can be taken. And um, I just want to use or, or want to refer to our audience questions here because there's one very interesting question being put, which I would like to, to put forward to Ms. Jensen, um, um, which is about the recent uh, the, the joint statement, which quite remarkable joint statement from last Friday from more than 50, by more than 50 uh, UN independent experts um, attached to the UN Human Rights Council on China. Uh, who have been calling for in a quite um, urgent uh, manner for a, a in, impartial and independent mechanism um, at the UN Human Rights Council to investigate and report on human rights in China, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Tibet. That's something very concrete. And, and if we look at, I mean, it would be very crucial for my very personal assessment to follow up <clears throat> to follow up on this very <clears throat> very quickly <clears throat> the question is how can we get the eu to actively support this call and the german eu presidency uh, thank you for the question i think there are different ways where we could support and the EU could support um, this initiative, once within the presidency that was already mentioned, but also within the presidency that we currently or will have um, starting tomorrow in the U uh, UN Security Council. But when we see China's behavior within the whole UN system, uh, we notice that they actually use, or the People's Republic actually uses um, UN bodies for their own good without having been called out for this behavior so far. So what we should do is we should try to reform or put forward reforms um, of the way the UN system works and how independent um, inquiry missions into the region, for example, to Xinjiang, but also Tibet could take place. That, uh, but China is obviously blocking every resolution in, uh, in the Security Council that deals uh, only merely with uh, with so-called uh, inter internal affairs. Um, so I think we should uh, we should address that and try to. I think it's or I know it is um, it is difficult to speak with one voice from the EU, uh, from the EU point of view. But every presidency we have within the uh, UN Security Council, it needs to be a UN president, uh, uh, sorry, a EU presidency. So um, depending on Germany or France or whoever has the uh, uh, a seat in the Security Council, 
should always try to check with uh, EU member states to be able to do a more um, strategic approach when it comes to the behavior or the um, assertment or within the uh, UN system. So I think this is not a very um, short time or short term endeavor that um, this question addresses, but I think it should be the right one. Um, and the first step would be to be granted access at a certain point and to, to ask for this access. And I think um, access can only be achieved by applying pressure because that's something China also does. And I think we need to speak the same language and we're not currently doing so. Thank you. I think it's it's from the view of human rights organizations. I mean, I'm, I may there may be also other. I'm pretty certain that other NGOs have a, a similar view. It would be utmo of utmost importance to 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 heed such calls from these independent mechanisms, independent mechanisms, um, because they are an important tool and they are a part of the UN system. And I think what happened last Friday. Um, was quite remarkable, and um, uh, we would be very happy if the German EU presidency, if I may comment here as a moderator, if um, the EU, uh, German EU presidency could pick this up. And that would be really something that could improve, um, help improve the situation on the ground. Um, another question, and I'm looking at our time, uh, we're running a little bit out of time, but another question from the audience to Mr. Glucksmann would be um, uh, referring to the Dalai Lama, um, who in 1988 uh, presented a five-point peace plan for the future of Tibet in the European Parliament, as you may recall. Um, the, um, uh, our, uh, the audience is asking here so far, 32 years later, no concrete steps have been taken. What can current MEPs do to help to realize this vision for a peaceful solution for Tibet? Certainly, this, uh, the answer will not be uh, done in two minutes. But if you can give us an idea, perhaps, on, on how you see the European Parliament's role in, in bringing about uh, change in Tibet. And, yeah, and more or less, um, yeah, five minutes, perhaps, if, you, if you're able. <laughs> yeah, obviously I, I was not there, but I, I know about it, and uh, and, and I can't uh, tell you that I have the solution. The only thing I, I can tell you, because you know the European architecture. I mean, I am a member of the European Parliament. I think it's a very democratic institution. It represents the general will of the European citizens, but uh, it's not where. Uh, you have the real power when it comes to uh, to actual uh, decision and acts that the uh, European Union should take in order to to support this vision. What we can do is to uh, to make sure that uh, it's not forgotten, that it's on the agenda. What we can do is to uh, uh, campaign and and I mean, if I may say so, harass executive powers. Uh, uh, so that they, they have to take into consideration the fact that uh, this vision has been uh, totally denied and, and, and uh, suppressed by the Chinese authorities and that uh, we have to understand that by not taking care and not caring for Tibet, uh, actually it's not only that we, uh, uh, that we uh, abandon uh, uh, people uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers from our uh, capitals, but it's that we are putting in danger our own interest and our own sovereignty. And that by not challenging China on the suppression of Tibetans and Uyghurs or Hong Kongese, by allowing them to threaten Taiwan or, or their neighbors, then we will end up being in trouble with the superpower that's used to this kind of crackdown. And that it's not only by, because we are idealists, that we need to support uh, 
a political and peaceful solution in Tibet and, and to, to fight against the crackdown, the crackdown system of the Chinese authorities and the Communist Party. It's because if we don't do that for Tibet, then, then we will end up uh, doing it for causes much closer to our homes. And uh, th that's something that I want to always remind uh, my fellow MEPs and public opinions that it's not uh, because we are just human rights campaigners. It's, it's because we are concerned also with the rise of an authoritarian system that understood from our lack of reaction that you can actually suppress people and it's okay. And even it's fruitful and it makes you grow more powerful. So what we allowed to do, and Tibet again was the first laboratory for that, uh, what we allowed uh, China to, to do is to grow into a, a counter model uh, and, uh, and an international one. So it's not only about uh, Tibetans because they are Tibetans or because they are human beings. It's also for us that we fight when we remind our executive branch that they should not forget about Tibet and that, and that they have to put pressure on China to get solution. Because right now, including in our own political opinions, you have people who think that actually authoritarian systems are much better for making things done. And we say that, oh, look, I mean, Chinese, they built hospitals in two days while in France, in order to build a military hospital during COVID-19 crisis, you need three weeks. So their system is much more efficient. And if we allow this counter model to grow, then we will have even an internal issue in Europe with the weakness of our institutions and the social consent to uh, liberal democratic values. So, I mean, I didn't respond, of course, because I don't have the keys in the European Parliament. I just have the keys to make sure that the cause is not forgotten and that you have resolutions coming and that you have voices coming. But I don't have the keys because the keys, your national government has them. So the way I see it is really we need to all unite our forces and to make sure that during the next six months, we have a campaign that put pressure on Angela Merkel because she has the power to actually do something. And, uh, and in this campaign, we need to speak about Tibet. We need to speak about Uyghurs. We need to speak about Hong Kong. We need to speak about Belt uh, uh, and uh, the Silk Road. And uh, we need to actually uh, raise awareness and get at least something done. And the first thing I see, yeah, there is uh, access, access to Tibet, access to Xinjiang, access to, uh, <coughs> to, to China, free access. But the second thing is targeted sanctions. I come back on it because I'm sure that Angela Merkel has the authority to actually make sure that there is a Magnitsky Act or a Human Rights Act of Free, uh, freedom of uh, whatever she wants act passed during the German presidency. And if we have that, then it will allow victims, it will allow NGOs, it will allow citizens to put pressure so that sanctions are taken, are put on the table, that assets can be frozen. And, and then, then you will see that our world will have some impact. But until we have this kind of mechanism, they, they will always think, and they are right, they are not stupid, the Chinese authorities, that it's talk, talk, talk. And, and that's why these six months are crucial. And I think we have a window of opportunity, actually, because it's Germany, because it's Merkel, and because there is growing awareness in European public that actually China, not as a country, but as a system, is a threat to our principles and to our interests. Thank you very much. I would like to take these as the uh, closing remarks for today. Thank you very much, um, Gudi Jensen, for being with us. Thank you, uh, Raphael Glucksmann, for being with us. Vincent Matten, for being with us. 
Um, let's be hopeful. We are going to uh, follow the German EU presidency very closely. We're going to look for opportunities to put pressure to, to have concrete results on the UN level, on the EU level, and on the national level, certainly. Everything is important. And um, yeah, thank you for your support. And I wish you every bit of success in your constituencies, in your parliament, uh, for your work. Thank you for joining us today. Everybody out there, thank you for being uh, with us today. Please follow us uh, on Twitter on Safe Tibet, Safe Tibet NL, Safe Tibet EU, Safe Tibet uh, Org, and uh, keep yourself updated on what's going on. Thank you, and tune in for the next, um, next edition of uh, Tibet Talks Europe. Bye-bye. Thank you.